On this episode of The Rabbit Show, we'll be learning from Dr. Steve Roche about advanced color genetics. Steve is an expert within the industry on color genetics. You'll see during this presentation, there's tons of different color combinations that are possible. And Steve makes a really practical approach to how to identify what is in your barn within each one of your rabbits um, and how to utilize that to have future success for what you're wanting to have for the color that you're looking for. Steve's been, and been breeding and showing rabbits for more than 50 years. He's an ARVA judge and been uh, doing numerous talks uh, throughout for a number of decades about this topic. We're really looking forward to this discussion on advanced color genetics. Kick it off, Steve. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, well, today uh, I've just recently updated the advanced uh, rabbit coat color genetics uh, for the very purpose of sharing this with uh, rabbit show participants. So let me start by, uh, and I'll give you just a momentary background. I've been an ARVA judge. Uh, this year will be my 40th year as a judge, but uh, I really have always loved the genetics part, and I've got more books from around the world on rabbit coat color genetics than probably anybody. Probably when I die, they'll go to the ARPA uh, library. But uh, let's talk about what my assumptions are for this particular class of your knowledge. I'd like to have an understanding for you uh, of basic coat color genetics, the basic terminologies. I'm gonna assume that you know how genes are basically transferred. Uh, how dominant and recessive gene action works. Uh, I'm assuming you know the basic uh, five gene pairs or 10 genes that govern coat color genetics, although there are another uh, 12 to 14 pairs. And then understand this, please, clearly. Everything we're gonna say today is theoretical. It's likely we've all accepted it and we've all bred literally hundreds of thousands, probably millions amongst us uh, of rabbits. And we validated most of this, but in the big scheme of things, I don't know of anybody that's ever done any electron microscope work to validate what we've got here. So we're saying it's theoretical, but in the big scheme of things, we're pretty sure it's right. All right, in the next hour, I'd like to address a number of things and I'm not gonna get into deep in the weeds with a lot of, a lot of uh, genetic words. I assume you've got the basic knowledge. So I've already talked about my assumptions of what you should know. Uh, I'm gonna talk about black and black is not black. The genetic variations that can occur there, white, and all the genetic variations that can occur there. I'm gonna talk briefly about the Vienna genes, red, and all the genetic variations are that can create red. The English genes, meaning the ones that we call English spot genes, but they're used uh, for any broken. So just accept that that's the broken genes actually. And then there are three Dutch genes. That's pretty much conventional wisdom that we accept. I'm actually gonna talk about for a moment about when the two of those interact. I'm gonna talk about the steel gene. It's pretty straightforward, although a lot of people seem to be confused by it. I'm gonna talk about the C series a little bit uh, more in length because the dominance hierarchy is unusual there. And most people think it's dominant and recessive and it's certainly not. I'm also gonna address wideband and Rufus modifiers and what they do. I'm gonna give you a master table, although to be honest, it's on a slide. If you can print this out, then you could use the master table. Otherwise, uh, uh, it's not gonna be much use to you, but I'm gonna show you that they do exist and they're out on the internet. There's 144 of the most common phenotypes and genotypes. And let's just stop real quick and say, you know, phenotypes are what you see and genotypes are what go together to make up that phenotype. So remember, we're gonna be talking about what's behind the scenes as well as what's in front of you. And then I'm gonna talk about a gene separator, what it is, why you need it, why many Europeans use it in their rabbit breeding, and why we have uh, people, uh, 
that raise rabbits in the United States for some reason don't use it. I used one for years, so I knew what the gene makeup of my rabbits were. It sounds like a very uh, expensive uh, piece of equipment. It's not a piece of equipment, but I'll explain that to you later. And then at the end, I'm gonna give you a real thumbnail sketch on probability and statistics, how to calculate the phenotypes, in other words, what are we gonna see if we breed these two rabbits together and then calculating the genotypes. So black, let's talk about black for a second. I wanna get your attention with this one. So that's why I'm starting with this one. I'm going to give you a list of five rabbits here that have genotypes. Now they're all basically, let's assume that as a person who's evaluating rabbits, you get five blacks on the table. Now, they may look like a rich black, they may look like a poor black, but they're black. And I'm guessing that for most people, they would not be disqualified showing in a show. So let's go with the first one. There's a rabbit in front of you. It's weak black. And for me, that means it probably has no rufous undertones and no wideband. And this would be right across the top here. This would be the genotype. Another rabbit comes up and it's, oh my gosh, it's beautiful, it's dark. You know, we're not talking about the type or the fur, we're just talking about the color, but it's probably got what I call a plus six rufous level and it has wide band. It's the blackest black you're gonna see. Another one's on the table, that is a weak black, probably the weakest of anything here. As you can see by the R question mark, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, there's almost no rufous. There's no wide band. Uh, it's basically not a full color. If you'll remember your C series, it's not a full color like this up here. It is actually a um, um, what we would call a light chin black. We could have a seal in there but it's a seal that may have a lot of rufous. So that allows it and wide band. So that allows it to actually be uh, in the class. And then you have one that's actually a seal. And I think most of us as judges know a seal when we see it, but there are some very dark seals that look almost like a dull black chin that could probably get by in this class too. So I'll talk about poor phenotype color a little bit later when I talk about rufous and wide bed. But understand, in this class of blacks, you can have all these genotypes and they'd probably still be acceptable. Now, I wanna make a point here and I want you to remember this at every slide. All rabbits always have all these gene pairs that I'm gonna be talking about, whether they are visible or not. See this little guy? Well, this little guy, understand, even though he looks like just a black solid rabbit, his chances are he will have this string. Now, in this case, he won't be a big A, that's a goody. He would be two little A's. But regardless of that, what I'm saying is these are all the possible gene pairs that he could have in him. And yes, he would have a place for the Viennas, a place for the Silvers, a place for the Brokens, a place for the Dutch, a place for Rufus. All of these are in every rabbit, but many of them will never be uh, exposed to your vision. Let's talk about red-eyed white. What color is it? Well, the phenotype is white. We all are very comfortable with this. What is its genotype color? Now, blacks, to my way of thinking, even though that explanation I just gave you, are not complex. Whites are super complex because whites, what can't they be and what will they not be? Well, understand that it won't express the genes. It won't look like it because, as I think you're all aware, those two little C's here in these genotypes erase all color. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later too. The pattern can be solid. The pattern can be a tan pattern. The pattern can be a goody. The pattern can actually be broken. I mean, I actually had a white years ago that I knew was a broken. 
because when I would breed her to a, another solid rabbit, I would get broken out of it. So, the, so in the big scheme of things, understand that a white can be all of these patterns. A white can be black or it can be chocolate. These are genotypes, not phenotypes, obviously. A white, while it won't express it, can be intense or it can be dilute. Uh, a point that I think you might find interesting, uh, some, of, some of my fellow judges and I have talked about this a good bit, understand, and this is an aside from the color piece, when a white rabbit has a very fine texture to its coat, it's fair to assume that that rabbit may actually be a dilute, a blue or a lilac, because dilute rabbits always have a finer hair shaft than do the intense. And that results in a softer coat. So any white rabbit that you, you touch, notice that I have a, a, a blue, a chocolate, and a, uh, and a black here. The, the dilute animals have a softer texture to their coat. They just do. And we as judges, often in a show, will allow for the fact that dilutes have a little less texture. Uh, and, you know, we assume that, that that's, you know, their hair shaft. And it is. The darker rabbits have a coarser texture. So if you've got a white rabbit in front of you and you feel two, one has a lot of resistance when you're feeling for texture and the other one has uh, almost none, you might wanna guess that that white rabbit that has almost none could likely be an actual genetic dilute. Also, while it won't express it, a white can carry tort, it can carry harlequin, it can even carry dutch. And they can be some of these, but you're never going to see it because, as I show up here in these genotypes, the two little recessive C's have erased everything. Okay. It can also be broken, steel, silver. It can even be a Charlie broken. It can be all these things that I've got here in the genotypes. So whites can be darn near everything, but what can it not be ever? A white can never be a chin. A white can never be a seal. A white can never be a hemi or a Californian. A white cannot be those. Why? Because these C series genes are above the two recessive Cs that you see here that make the white the white. I hope you're keeping up with this. Basically what I'm saying is that we cannot have anything in the C series. There's no full color, there's no hard chin, there's no soft chin, there's no, there's no sable, there's, it can't be any of those things because you have these two C placeholders that are recessive, okay? And I'll get to this when I talk about the idiosyncrasies in the C series. So, We've always heard, haven't we, that if you breed white to white, you're gonna get white. Is that true? Well, it is true if you're dealing with red-eyed whites. But we also know that there's a white out there called a blue-eyed white. A blue-eyed white is called by something we know as the Vienna gene. It's a strange gene action. It usually has no effect if it's homozygous dominant. Homozygous dominant simply means that it is uh, not going to impact the color. And most, remember, all rabbits have this place, but most of them are the big capital V, capital V. However, when the homozygous pair is there, uh, heterozygous pair is there, meaning it's a large V and a small V, you actually get uh, the beautiful blue-eyed white that we want. But the presence of the, I mean, let me back up. The presence of the homozygous gene, the recessive Vs in the Vienna, creates a blue-eyed white. If it's, a, if it's a heterozygous pair, it creates a broken. And I actually found online this picture of a broken that doesn't look like many brokens that you see. And I'm pretty sure we can count on the fact that this was the result of a Vienna, in other words, a blue-eyed white being crossed to some other uh, rabbit. Now, what if we cross a blue-eyed white to a red-eyed white? 
Let's take our time and think about this. Both are genetic agoutis. I'm making that assumption because of an explanation point. So what are we saying? Well, we're saying that basically, if I cross a blue-eyed white to a red-eyed white, we're focusing not on the recessive C gene, we're focusing on the Vienna gene. Remember, a red-eyed white is going to have the two big Vs. A blue-eyed white is gonna have the two little Vs, which means that the red-eyed white can only offer a big V. The blue-eyed white can only offer a small V. So genetically speaking, if you cross a blue-eyed white to a red-eyed white, what are you probably gonna get? What's what I just explained right here. It is, you're broken. So white to white, in this case, is going to end up with brokens. Red, all right. First of all, I've, I've researched and researched to find you a nice range of pictures having to do with red. Red can be almost orange. Red can be deep, deep, almost mahogany or a lot of colors in between. But how do we make red? Well, there are some people who would have you believe that there's only one way. There are many, many ways. Red can be less red, can be deep red. We start, and most people, if you get reds on the table that are not extremely uh, uh, deep, it's probably going to be just a regular agouti rabbit, but it has the two non-extension genes. Non-extension genes erase those rings, the agouti rings, and so it appears to be red. We wanna make it better, Instead of using a black-based rabbit, use a chocolate-based rabbit. If you want to do even better to get the red out, find one that not only has it on extension and the chocolate, but it has wide band. If you want to go further than that to make a really awesome red, then you find them that have a heavy-duty uh, Rufus out at about the sixth level. So, uh, I have done a lot of experimenting over the years and what I have breeding and breeding and breeding. And what I have found is that you can actually make a red out of a tan pattern rabbit. What you have to have is the non-extension gene, the wide band gene and heavy rufous. Uh, I uh, have talked to some Trianta breeders and I am not sure uh, that they are convinced that it's an agouti non-extension. Uh, I believe when we first came to this country, and I think Triantas may be this way, uh, they could be easily a tan pattern given the higher rufus that they've got. So uh, let me say that, that there are so many opportunities to make a good red that you need to ask yourself, do I wanna get into reds? And if I do, how can I find extra rufus factor, what breeds can I, or what colors can I breed together that can give me this great combination of uh, chocolate base, non-extension, wide band, and high rufus. Broken gene transmission odds. I think probably half the folks out there understand uh, the very simple transmission that happens with brokens. Now, I'm using as an example here, English spots. And I've got a Punnett square here because a lot of folks are comfortable with those. Basically, what we're saying is that if I have a broken rabbit, its genetic combination is going to be EN, capital E, little N, and little E, little N. That makes a broken. You look at these two broken down here. If I cross them together, the Punnett square is going to show me that what have I got? Well, in the end, I've got upper right and upper right, I have got half of them, or over here to your right, 50% will be broken. What happens is that when you cross, uh, when you also have to come up to 100%, 25% of bringing a broken to a broken are gonna be what we call Charlie, and 25% are what we call sports or solids. Okay, so when you breed two broken rabbits together, you can expect 
Now, you may say I've had litters of broken to broken. I've got 100% broken. That's, that's quite possible. You could get 100% Charlie, but and you could get 100% sports. But actually, statistically speaking, over a number of litters, this is the outcome that you'll get. Now, let's talk about breeding a Charlie out of those litters, a Charlie to a broken. If that happens, we end up, again, here's your Punnett score. We end up with 50% like the Charlies and 50% like Brokens. Pretty straightforward. And again, over time, this is what you will get. Now, let's breed the Broken to a solid in that breed. What do we get? Again, 50% like the Broken, 50% like the solid. Now, what a lot of smart checker giants and English spot breeders do to maximize the number of showable rabbits they have. And this is an interesting piece that uh, it, you should know this. If you don't, you'll know it now. If we cross a sport or a solid of any breed to a Charlie of that breed, we get 100% English spots, checker giants, Rhinelanders, whatever you're looking for here. Uh, but 100% because the Charlie, again, is capital E-N, capital E-N. The sport is recessive E-N, recessive E-N. So every one of them has the same outcome. Now, I'm not talking about patterns. Uh, I don't think anybody's really done some solid work yet on how to predict patterns of broken rabbits. But understand that patterns follow random displays. Gene modifiers are not exactly known. Nobody's done the work. We get a pretty one. We just think, well, that's great. It's pretty. If it's the standing, it's the standing pattern for the English spot, the checker giant and the Rhinelander, those have gotten pretty much refined. And credit to those breeders and those clubs who have worked on that. But as far as general brokens, random is still pretty much what we can expect. Charlie's. The ones that are disqualified at shows for not having enough markings come in a lot of breeds, in a lot of different uh, uh, fur structures, but the reality is they are mostly white. They have very little bit of black, as you can see on these, or brown or blue or whatever. But the point is they come in many forms and in many breeds. I'm gonna mention Dutch. Uh, I raised Dutch for about four years back in the uh, 80s. I really enjoyed them, but I did a little bit of homework and there's not a lot of research done. So I'm gonna use the term conventional wisdom. The next slide, I'm gonna show you all the variations that could come out of Dutch. But do understand that, that for conventional wisdom, most Dutch breeders believe, understand that there are three genes that create Dutch. That gives you six pairs of gene combinations. So that gives you six different possibilities. Now, a good Dutch can be either a DUD, DUW, or a DUD, DUW, which is basically the same thing. Okay, I just ran them three and three on here. If you'll take a look, most rabbits, remember I said every rabbit carries displacement. So no effect is capital D-U, capital D-U. You look at your, I don't care whether it's an English spot, whether it's a mini Rex, whether it's a New Zealand, all of them have a place and they carry this D-U gene. Or if, if they're not looking like a Dutch, they carry the D-U, D-U. Solid with spots is D-U, D-U-W. And I don't expect anybody to memorize this. You can maybe write it down and then start working with it. And as you do over time, you'll, you'll accept it. But for instance, DUD, DUD is too little white and it's more solid. I have actually spent my time over the last number of years going through the internet, looking for pictures that could help people understand this. And for rabbit show people, here you have it all on one page. Uh, these are my guesses. But this is a DUD, DUW, a good Dutch right here, not in a box. Given the descriptions I just gave on the previous page, you can see 
that we have poor markings. We may have a lot of white, D-U-W, D-U-W. We may have very little, D-U-D, D-U-D. But in the lower right, we have just a regular black rabbit. Why? Because remember, they have the D-U placement, but it doesn't express itself. And this is what 95% of the rabbits out there carry. So I hope this is a little bit useful in your introduction. I always have to enjoy the fact that, remember, every rabbit has broken genes, the EN, the EN, like I showed you on the uh, English spot example earlier. But remember, there's places for all of these. And sometimes the English or the spotting gene and the Dutch gene, which are always there, interact. Are they broken? Or are they solid with a low level of Dutch? Well, uh, as maybe a D-U-D, D-U-D. See this booted lower right here? Many Rex uh, folks have a lot of issue with this. Sometimes it pops up and it goes back somewhere to somebody messing up the uh, D-U-D-U gene. But if you can see, these may be broken or they may be Dutch marked, small level Dutch marked. I went out and found some pictures for you. What could split a butterfly on a broken rabbit? Well, what could cause that butterfly to be gone? To be honest, as you see in, in this rabbit and this rabbit and this rabbit, it could be that the Dutch gene, remember Dutch have erased the color right up the center of their face, right up to the point. So the, the blaze as we call it. Picture a broken rabbit that has both the Dutch mark, which this one right here on the right looks like it could easily be, or, and the broken, those together can interact, causing the butterfly to be erased. Steel is a complex gene that folks often have a problem understanding because it's known to hide. Now remember, every rabbit has uh, a place for the two E genes. And ES, the steel, is at the top of the pecking order. It's even more dominant than the big E, big E for full extension. Uh, it almost always, it's fully expressed in a goody. It's rarely seen in tan patterns. Uh, but when it is seen, it basically causes black ticked guard hairs. We see in shows where people show steels. Oftentimes this could be in, let's say, um, French lops or, or some mini lops. There's other breeds that allow steel also. But guards will talk, uh, judges will talk about gold tipped steel or white tipped steel. There is a definite genetic difference. What is it? Well, if you'll look here, steel when it's ticking is white, it, cause, it comes from the chinchilla gene. The chinchilla gene, the CCHD gene, which I'm gonna talk about in just a minute, changes yellow to white. So if you see a white tipped steel, understand that deep in that animal there, it's a chin. And uh, uh, that's what the, the chin gene erases that white or that, that yellow making it white. Okay, now I wanna talk about the C series. And I want you to just, just take a breath and understand that, that this is a five gene series. The C has complete dominance at the top end where the big C and the CCHD genes are, an incomplete dominance at the bottom. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples in the next few slides to show you that. But uh, sometimes the C genes will modify. So I'm gonna give you some examples. I find the C gene about as fascinating, uh, the C series about as fascinating as any. Because remember the action of the series in the middle and in the end is intended to remove color. Yellow is a basic color for rabbit coats. And some are more and some are less yellow as the phenotypes drastically show us. Let's get into the C series for just a minute. 
first of all, the C series. Understand that if you have a full C, that's the most dominant in the C series, you get rabbits like you see here. Full color, it may be a full color dilute like this lilac. It may be full color with all the tan. It may be full color agouti. But the point is that yellow is pretty much there. And the full C, the large C, the most dominant gene in this series, doesn't change any yellow at all. Okay. Let's go to the next one. The most dominant is the chinchilla gene, the dark chin. We have CCHD, which is dark, and CCHL, which is light. So the dark chinchilla gene removes all yellow, 100%. So what are you seeing here? Well, you're seeing uh, silver fox, you're seeing uh, magpie harlequin. Remember there in the harlequins, there's the jap and the magpie. The jap is yellow or orange bands or bars. Magpie has no yellow. Why? Because it's a chinchilla rabbit. It has erased all of the yellow. If you take a look down here, uh, silver martin, I think it's, it's fairly common knowledge that a silver martin rabbit is simply a standard chin with a tan pattern. If you want to have a nice two breed combination to show in different places, enjoy it by having both the uh, uh, standard chin to show, the black silver martin to show, or crossing those together based upon how closely bred they are, they'll have both. The yellow level. Well, the yellow level uh, at the C series, next one we have is the CCHL, the light chin. It removes some yellow, leaves some black or brown. So what we're looking at is the black versus the seal. You see the seal here. Seal here basically has very little uh, of the intense black. So the CCHL, the light chin, simply removes some yellow, but not all yellow, which is why a black rabbit, which has no yellow removed, looks so intense, but yet the seal uh, is uh, got some yellow left in it. That's why it looks that way. Let's go to the uh, CH gene. The CH gene, which is the fourth in the series, is what we call the Himalayan gene, the, the Hemi gene. It removes all color except on the eyes, uh, it, all, all color including the eyes, giving them a pink eye, but the extremities, the feet, the nose, the ears, the tail, still retain color. I think it's an important thing to note too, just uh, as an add-on, is that as judges, we know that these that you see on the top two here, the Himalayan and the Californian, notice they have high, uh, what we call nose smut. They have good intense ear bases. They have very long color on their front and back legs. We know these are CHCH. This is the most perfect explanation. But when we cross, and judges know this, when we cross a white to a hemi, the resulting animal is a CHC. And that always results in abbreviated nose markings and abbreviated foot markings. I'm gonna talk about this again in a second. I'll give you some more examples, okay? At the bottom, we have the CC. When you have a two recessive C genes at the very bottom of the hierarchy in the C series, this is called an eraser. It removes all color from all areas, including the eyes. It has the recessive gene only being visible when in the homozygous pairing of CC. The reason I started out this presentation talking about whites was so that you could understand that the eraser that we're talking about that erases all color hides so much of the genetics. 
whether it's a Angora, whether it's an Irland Dwarf, whether it's a white New Zealand, they all are that color white because of the recessive C gene. Some anomalies in this series. Uh, I said that they were incompletely dominant toward the bottom of the series. Let's start with the CCHL, the light chin. All right, the light chin or seal gene uh, is not real strong. As a matter of fact, when you see a seal, it's got to be a C, CHL, C, CHL. If we cross a seal with either a white or a Californian, we then will get sables. Sable breeders know this. The American Sable Club, uh, I wrote an article for them on their genetics five or six years ago. Uh, one of the things that we have to understand is that they are going to get, just as the English spot, checker giant, Rhinelander folks get, they are going to always have offspring that come across uh, in mixed colors. I hope this will help. If you breed a sable to a sable, you are gonna end up with 50% sable, 25% seal, and 25% white. If you breed a seal, to a sable. You're going to get 50% seal and 50% sable. But just like as we talked about in that anomaly with the E N genes, if you were to cross a seal with a white, you get 100% American sables. 100% guarantee. Now, uh, I hope that I hope that wasn't confusing, uh, but those breeders that raise sables say spot on, thumbs up. If you breed, again, I'm going back to my point now about good marked Californians and good marked Himalayans, and Himalayans are almost pure, but Californian breed has been so uh, inbred with New Zealand's that I wanna reiterate this point. The Hemi gene is weak. The CH gene is weak and it's incompletely dominant. This one on the left is an absolutely beautiful Californian, and I know, guarantee you, it is CHCH. If we cross it with a New Zealand offspring, end up looking like this on the right. You see that the noses are abbreviated, the foot coloring is abbreviated. These do not go up. If you look on the left, these are CHCH Californians. See how the nose goes way up. Now the ear bases are clean. If we could see the feet here, but we can see them down here, all the way down to the ankle on the back, all the way up to the ankle on the front. These are CHCH. Too many Californian breeders have not concentrated on these markings because type has so much points, but understand that we judges always know. You bring these to the table, you have been crossing with New Zealand. I want to talk about wide band for a, a minute. It's most evident in Belgian hares, the Flemish, uh, and tan breeds, where there's no undercolor on the belly. Wide band genes, uh, basically what they do is they allow deeper colors to be more visible. In other words, if you don't have the uh, chinchilla genes in there, Wide band allows yellow to show even more vibrantly. It's completely dominant. If it is, if it is homozygous or if it is heterozygous, the animal will have a normal band width. Uh, the band width will get wider on an agouti animal if you have the wide band gene, which is recessive, which is, uh, excuse me, which is basically when you blow into a fur, and I, I apologize for not having some pictures I should have, but basically when you blow into the coat of an agouti, if the center, if, if the, the band is wider, you can look at it and see that, that the, the center band, rather than being maybe a quarter of an inch, is wider. I can guarantee you when I blow into the coat of an agouti animal and I see wide band, I know when I flip it over, the belly is going to have no undercolor, none. 
So let's talk about Rufus for a minute. This is additive genetics. I spent probably 15 years working with developing a tan color animal, and I worked with the Rufus modifiers constantly. The assumption is that they are basically six slots that take up the Rufus coloration. They're, they can be really, really deeply yellow, deeply intense, deeply Rufus, and that will be a six plus. There can almost always, there can be none, which means there's almost no Rufus and those are minuses. What I wanna remind you is that the Rufus modification intensifies the yellow that underlies black or chocolate hair shafts, and this impacts the dark colors. If you recall, when I was talking about blacks, I was talking about a R plus six that intensifies the yellow, which intensifies the black. This is a chart that, and I'm not going to apologize for it. Uh, I think if you've got this presentation, you might be able to print out some of these. Uh, the concept is that we can split these six. Rufus, if there are six places, parent one can be very light and they can only contribute three. Remember that any rabbit can only offer half of what they have at the gene pair. Or in this case, since there are six places, they can only offer three. That's the way genetics works. So a very light parent might only have uh, three pluses and three minuses. But in any case, that parent could offer randomly to medium rufous might be three plus, three minus. They could offer all three very light. They could offer one with only one plus, two plus or three plus. So you see there are four opportunities here. You look at parent two and go down the left you will see exactly the same combination. And when we combine these, if, if a parent that has the Rufus genes that are three minus and the other parent also adds three minus, you're going to get a six minus rabbit, no Rufus impact whatsoever. As the roll of the dice occurs, I've got different combinations in here. And you can see that toward the middle, you can get light medium, which uh, we went with the parent being that, but there's the chance that the dark plus and the dark plus will give you a very dark rabbit. Now understand this completely. This is why we have reached the point with tan rabbits, with, with certainly Belgian hares, where the parents are almost guaranteed to be six plus. Each parent is six plus, even when they split their genes, the only thing they can offer is three pluses from each side which means as you continue to breed your dark rufous animals, you select the darkest against the darkest. And ultimately all you're gonna get is dark. There are no minus holding places there. This is an example. You can see the deep rufous. You can see the very deep uh, that I had developed on this mini Rex here. Uh, these are mini Rex also that had the very six plus. This is the dilute that had uh, the six plus. And this is a very nice looking uh, tan rabbit uh, that, has, that has so much rufous, it almost looks red. Anyway, these are the outcomes that you can get once you get to the six plus, six plus level for rufous. I am offering a master list on the next slide. It's not gonna be legible unless you print it out and take a look at it. But it does not assign any first structure. It doesn't mention steel genes, spotting genes, harlequin genes, silvering genes, wide band genes. Uh, but this is a chart. Now, again, I only show this because you can find this on the internet. I don't have a particular site, but many excellent, uh, knowledgeable people that understand rabbit genetics uh, have gotten this. I actually found it on a European site first, but, uh, and again, I don't wanna beleaguer this point, but there are the genotypes over here for all of the colors that you see on the left, which might help you if you're a beginner. I wanna talk about gene separators. And this is something that American breeders 
do very poorly. But I encourage you, as somebody who's interested enough uh, to, to listen to this rabbit show presentation, to understand that what we've got here is an animal that can help you know what the genes are in other rabbits, okay? We wanna be able to predict. We usually know what the dominant genes are because that's the way the rabbit looks. The best way to know the recessive genes is to breed your rabbit to a rabbit that has a lot of recessive color genes. Here's some examples for you. A separator, well, well first of all, what is a separator? A separator is a rabbit that has a lot of recessive genes. For instance, we know little a, little a is a solid, okay? That is the lowest in the A hierarchy. Little b, little b is the lowest, that's chocolate. That's the lowest in the black brown category. We don't want to use a CC because that would be a white. So what's the next best? To use something that is looking like a Himalayan or a Californian. We want it to be dilute. We want it to be non-extension. So what is the, this is the genotype I would love for you to have in your gene separator. So what's the phenotype? It could be a lilac tort hemi, which is the perfect. It's hard to get, but a lilac tort isn't that hard to make. I mean, you can find them out there. That gives you this gene, which means you've got recessive. Recessive, you got the C's here, but then you've got the recessives and recessives. You breed it to anything you want in your herd, and immediately you're going to find out because of what color offspring you get, what kind of gene pool likely the other mate that this gene separator bred to is carrying. It separates uh, everything out in this case, uh, except an E series. So let's look at this. This is your rabbit. Who do you, what do you know? Will you assume that, let's start, let's say it's a Sandy Agouti and you breed it to your gene separator. If you breed it to the separator, if you get a solid or a tan, then you know the other A series gene is an A or an AT. If you get a chocolate, remember it's carried over here, you know that the second B series gene is a B. Small B, chocolate. If you get a dilute, you know that the second series in the D placement is a dilute. And uh, if you get a non-extension or a harlequin, you know that the second one in the E series uh, exists because again, your gene separator helps you breed to these. I had a gene separator that was a, uh, a lilac, uh, uh, self uh, that I used for years and I could know the genes. These are what lilac torch separators look like in all different breeds. So uh, this is what you would, if you have one sitting over there and they say, what's that? You can't show that. Maybe not, but it's worth its weight literally uh, in gold to those of us who do our, our genetics work. I'm going to talk just a minute about probability and statistics. Uh, if you already know this stuff, then I got to ask you, you know, where did you learn it? Because the reality is I've spent years and years trying to figure out what possible outcomes. Now, this is purely theoretical. Nobody's going to do this, but I want to go with a basic review for you. How many genes are there and how many pairs in coat color? Sorry about that. Uh, the basic uh, review, how many genes? Well, in each series, we know that the A has three. We know that the B has two. So there's three different pairs. If we have three, we know there's six different pairs. C has five, so that means we could have 15 different possible pairs. D has two, so three. So let's add these, let's multiply these together because this is gonna tell you basically how many possible genotypes, genotypes are there? Six times three times 15 times three times 10 from over here. We end up with 8,100 possible genotypes. 
That's just for these five series. If there's any one possible genotypes, how many different phenotypes are there? Uh, and here's an aside before I go to that next one. If you combine with the other five series, it yields over three, almost four million different genotypes. Now, how many possible phenotypes? Phenotype is what you see, okay? The A series has three. Again, B series has two, just like we talked about before. Dilution has two, extension has four. So what do we have? Well, what we have is three times two times five times two times four equals 240 different appearing rabbits. So there's 240 phenotypes. And again, that's just for these basic ones. Now, we did say 81 genotypes and 240 phenotypes, right? Okay, genes are only, uh, why are there fewer phenotypes? Well, they're only available in pairs. And again, you know, the dominant gene generally takes care of the, uh, of the appearance of the animal. So what's the phenotype of these two genotypes? Well, if you look at these two, you say, well, look, they're different there, they're different there, they're different there, they're different there, they're different there. Wow. What are they? Well, in the big scheme of things, they are all black otters. Both of these are black otters because you have the tan pattern, you have the black, you have the full color, you have the intense, and you have the non-extension. They simply end up being black otters. Okay? The recessives have disappeared. Even though the genotypes are totally different, the phenotype is the same. So mathematically, when we're trying to combine these, we don't know. When we cross two agouti, how many of what do we get? Well, we probably haven't used a gene separator to test these. So we don't know. See, there's question marks next to all these. How many of this is there? Well, once you do know the exact, and I mean exact, combination uh, of genes that are there, you can actually calculate it. Now, this is just a scholastic exercise for fun. I want to cross two castor agouti, uh, whatever color you want to call them, chestnut if you're a dwarf person. But you cross these two. And what I'm saying is that to get this castor agouti, let's pretend we crossed a chin with a lilac tort. We still ended up with a castor agouti, but my gosh, look at this string. On the other one, I pretended I crossed a lynx to a white, which was actually a black otter. And so what did I get here? There's the genotype, there's the genotype, and the offspring carried this. So these are the two I want to use. What are the possible outcomes when crossing these two, what would appear to you to be just agouti animals? Well, if we break the groups into what's possible, we know that there are agouti and tan. We've looked at it and said, they you know there's black and chocolate, full color and chin, intense and dilute, and extension and non-extension. So you simply multiply two times two times two times two times two, and we end up with 32. So there's 32 distinct phenotypes by crossing these two animals. How many different genotypes would that be? Well, the truth is, going back to my math process, and I don't want to bore you by going through details, you multiply four times three times four times three times three, 432 genotypes. So 32 phenotypes, 432 genotypes. Some of you like using Punnett squares. So using that, I have set this up to show you that the A series, shows there are going to be 75% agouti and 25% tan. They're going to be on the B series, 75% black and 25% chocolate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want you yawning, so stay with me. I have done the math. I have done the math for all of these. I know they're right because I ended up with 100% down here at the bottom. And these are the 32 different phenotypes that I ended up with. I'm just showing you this is possible. I don't want to turn you into statisticians, but uh, it was a fun exercise for me. 
And I think what it does is explain why we can have 32 phenotypes, but over 400 genotypes. So how do we do at our predicting? Well, uh, I put all of that here. Uh, we have 75% agouti, 75% black, and across the board, everything I said to you that we would end up getting, trust me, you've got this now, you can take your time and look through it, but uh, we validated ourselves. So understand that our genetics presentation is about done now. What we've done is it did not address issues such as modifiers, except for Rufus, linkage, linkages to inheritance, mutations. We didn't talk about Angora fur, Rex fur, Satin fur, Asterix fur, Possum, or Hairless. We didn't talk about dwarfism and lethal genes like the peanut max factor in dwarfs, others. We didn't talk about the silvering gene, which is a fascinating gene. We didn't talk about heritability estimates. Uh, and I, I will say, that if you haven't read about uh, heritability estimates, you ought to look these up. When I tell people that a, a reproductive, when they say I keep a doe because does out of her because she always had big litters, the odds of that being inherited is only 10%. Uh, production traits, production meaning uh, uh, number again in a litter, uh, only about between 30 and 10%. Product traits are highly inherited. Why do you think you don't keep badly pinched commercial animals? It's because they will pass that on to their young about 60% of the time. If you haven't done it, read an article on heritability estimates. And I'm gonna end with this. I think this is gorgeous. If any of you ever make it, why don't you give me a call? I'd love to see it. But more importantly, I don't know how to do it. I'm thinking, maybe a sleepover, if we could just get these guys to work. Uh, that's all I've got for you. I hope that this was interesting. I think this is one of those presentations uh, that what we need to do uh, is to look over this rabbit show presentation a few times. Take your time, go back over it, write notes, and then you can share the wealth with everybody else. And that's it. I am finished and thank you very much. Thank, thank okay. you, Steve. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thank I'm, you. This is great. Um, I have some follow-up questions for uh, what you did. The, the wealth of information in this presentation is amazing. And um, yeah, if you're willing to send me the uh, PowerPoint, I'll uh, get it so that people can download it, especially on those slides that are- I small. absolutely will. One of the questions that I have is, um, diving deeper into the, like, the Rufus modifier, um, I thought it was interesting how you said, you know, that you could have two parents have the three and the three pluses. Is it that they're, and it is as clean as just like that there's the, the three pluses and three minuses. It's not just like in certain slots in those six slots. Like there's, that it could be a plus minus plus minus plus minus. Absolutely. Or, it doesn't matter. In the big scheme, the, again, this is theoretical genetics, but in the big scheme of things, you know, if they're each, each of, and, and we're just guessing six. I mean, it could be eight. I don't think it's as low as four, but, but uh, in each of these, it's just a coin toss. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Which means that when you get to what I would call medium light tans, for instance, with the plus, three pluses and three minuses, you know, understand that when they cross together in the best of all possible worlds, each could offer three pluses, which means there's six pluses in the offspring, which means two medium lights could actually pop you a really great one. That is so rare, but most of them are somewhere in between there. And again, you know, for the years that I worked with this, my God, what a range I got. And of course I kept trying to keep but this is the dilemma, right, with rabbit breeders. I keep trying to save the darker ones, but they generally didn't have the type or the fur or any of the <laughs> other stuff that you wanted to have. So it was kind of a coin toss. Yeah, and that, I think that's the part that's really hard. I mean, you had just shown that there was 4 million different color combinations out there. And there's an, a similar number, I'm sure, in terms of the way that um, body type and such work and all the other oh, things yeah. that we're looking for. And, and so getting the ones that are awesome, it, it is uh, really difficult. 
yeah. yeah. Um, so is color genetics different between different breeds? No, I cannot, I cannot, I can always find a rationale other than the genes to account for. I mean, you know, let's be honest, it shows all we see is, you know, I mean, if, if, if it's molting badly, the color is awful. You know, if it's uh, been stained, you know, some people don't keep their cages as clean as others. I mean, I could find lots of rationales, but I think what we're talking about holds across the board because the way this is set up is that it does allow for variation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's so much, you know, I am convinced there's, there's more that we don't know than more that we do know. I, I agree with what you're saying. I think that's one of those things that's a misconception that people have is that, well, hey, I have the Dutch breed, so it's totally different than anything else. Or I have this breed, and it's totally different than anything else. Yeah, they're not. It's not. It's not. It's it's just uh, every and every rabbit, even if it's black or blue, it has all those other uh, um, uh, letters within there. Yeah, placeholders. Yeah. Placeholders, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so then, my follow-up question to that is: Can you breed any color rabbit to any color rabbit? Well, since uh, since there's no lethal gene, sure. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, but I mean, everybody's wanting to have a purpose. So I mean, you're like you had said throughout the presentation, you're doing it. Uh, for the predictability and for improving color within within the breed or what your ultimate goal is. Yeah, and I, well, I think just having a, for instance, having a basic understanding of what you're dealing with, you know, even though it's conceptual, is is going to help people do better. For instance, that that whole discussion I had on the Dutch gene. Again, that goes back. I mean. Dick Bernhardt wasn't talking about it in the 1970s when I talked to him. He was like the ultimate Dutch guy. But genetics would have been confusing to him, but he knew what he had to do. But now, the reason I, I did that research on finding all those different Dutch-looking rabbits, if you will, is because they actually are out there, and it happens. Now, as you continue to breed good Dutch, the DUD to the DUW, the DUD DUW solids, you'll get you'll get pretty much consistently marked rabbits with some aberrations. But Bernhardt told me, literally, I remember way before I was ever a judge, he said, look, if you want to be good at Dutch, he said, the first thing you got to do is not show for two years. You get the best ones you can get. And you breed and you don't even look at the markings. You breed for type. You breed for type. He said, I don't care if the blaze goes off here. I don't care if the undercut runs up. I don't care if they have tight front arms. I don't care. He said, you spend two years breeding and breeding and breeding until you get tight locked in. Markings are going to come. And he didn't know about all these other genes, but he knew what to pick for. But that was the best advice I ever had, because let's be honest. When we're at a show, you know, there's some really good, well-marked rabbits, but type, sometimes they're so damn badly pinched or low in the shoulder or whatever. And you can tell these people are picking strictly for markings. But once you lock the type in, like he told me to do, then the rest of it's just calling for markings because you got the type. You know, that's the kind of advice that people aren't giving anymore. At least I don't hear it. I agree. I agree. Um, I really liked how you had talked about the, that gene separator of, of finding, uh, finding a rabbit to be able to then uh, breed to what you have in your barn to know what you actually have. So you're, you're I like him. Right. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. And it totally makes sense because then you instantly know where you're at and, and you know what that rabbit's going to produce and throw. So then after you've done that, then then you know you then you can create those Punnett squares for this sire and this dam. Be comfortable creating this. Yeah, yeah. but but again, uh, I've 
never talked to anybody about these. The few people I have, it's just like, okay. Because, but the Europeans, and I read a, a European genetics book 15 years ago that talked about it. And I just got hooked on it. And so I just, you know, made one actually. <coughs> it took a couple of years, but, and again, they're so hard to get that, boy, you just better treat it nice and keep it alive. Mine was a buck, thank goodness, because I could use them a lot. But, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so fo a follow-up to that. Um, somebody has um, two rabbits that are black, but way back in the pedigree, fourth generation back, it's a goody opal, a goody opal, a goody opal. Um, one of the things that, so my question now is, one of the things that I would say that breeders are fearful of sometimes is they look at the pedigree and they go, oh my gosh, I don't want an agouti or I don't want a chestnut or a castor or I don't want an opal. That's way in the background of it. In that example, is that rabbit going to, is that going to pop up? No, it can't. It can't. One of the things to understand, and I think this is the biggest misunderstanding many people have about these pedigrees. You see what the parents were, but you don't know what that whole litter looked like. So you don't know what they, know what they carried, okay? But let's be honest, if you got a black, you know there's no way it's ever gonna throw in a goody because a goody is higher on the hierarchy and it's not there. But I think it's important to understand that people take offspring that could be a lot of different colors. They have the same parents, so the pedigree looks the same. <coughs> But the, but the outcomes are totally different. For instance, you know, I've had people say, I've had people say, well, you know, I had a black and a lilac or a black and a, and a blue when I bred them, you know, and, you know, I got blacks and blues. So what else did you get? You know, the chances are good. You could have gotten a chocolate out of that or you could have gotten a lilac, depending on what the parents carry. Okay. And I may have that on one pedigree and people say, well, how in the world would you get a lilac out of a black and a chocolate? Well, it's easy. You got a dilute gene on both sides and the black carried a recessive chocolate. I mean, I can rationalize looking at pedigrees, what could have happened. But again, when people look that far back, you know, things popping up are almost not going to happen, especially if they're higher in the, in, in that particular gene series. Correct. And, and that's where I think that, like you said, that then using your gene separator rabbit in the barn, then you know what that rabbit is when you start breeding it as well. I mean, you could, you already have the assumption or you, that rabbit's black. So you know, that it can only be on this level of the A series. So it yeah. can't produce the agouti and such. Right. Uh, but at the same time, um, by then breeding it to the your gene se separator, you know any additional kind of dilute or uh, yeah down the line yeah the D's, the D's, yeah. The D's, yeah 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 um I know that's just one of those questions that, that I hear a lot um looking so if I wanted to make a richer blue color how would you do that is that the modifiers that we didn't talk about or is that how, how well, would you say it, it, it again it comes down as simple as what we've been doing for 100 years and that's take the darkest blue added to the darkest blues obviously for instance have you seen the blue hollister hollister yeah, yeah. okay that's a deep blue OK, I'm going to guess that if we had some kind of electron microscope, it's probably got Rufus at the five or six level. Rufus underlays, you know, some of these colors and certainly just because it's a blue color doesn't mean that, that, that the Rufus isn't there. It's going to be there. The deeper colors, I'm convinced, are often, especially in solid rabbits like that, are often an impact of wideband which carries the yellow further. And then the rufous, which makes it deeper, but we don't see the yellow because the blue is on top of it. Remember blue is just black. 
it, it's like the point I made about, um, about the whites that have a finer fur being dilute and the coarser fur being more than likely uh, an intense color. Well, it's, it has to do a lot with, uh, you know, the diameter of the hair shaft. But remember that even the blue still has yellow underneath it can have rufous, just like the black can. So it, it's conceptually, it's kind of difficult. But, you know, I used to try to explain it to kids at 4 eights. It was like, if you take a, like just a, a, a very thin stick and you paint it with a color, okay, a yellow, let's say, and then you paint it with a black. Okay, well, the black has to cover up the yellow, but in rabbits, that just intensifies, I think, the attraction, the, whatever the pigments do. Uh, but it, 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 it just seems to me there are layers. When you get to the lower part of the C series, that yellow starts disappearing, just like the C on black. Okay, so you know that, and I had some good pictures, I think, in this presentation to show what a real seal looks like, mm. as opposed to a real black. And uh, but I am convinced there are so many bad blacks that are shown as seals. And you know, again, anybody said, well, how you know, it shows, they'll say, well, how do I know if it's really a seal? Easy, breed it to a white. What do you get? Sables. Then it is. If you don't get any, then you know it's a bad black. Mm. Super easy to check if a rabbit's a seal. Super easy. Just breed it to a white. And if you don't get sable, then it's not a seal. Those are all the questions I have. Well, hey, I appreciate your time. Because, yeah, I'll uh, email it to you. I'll email you the presentation. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Steve. We'll see you. You're welcome. Bye-bye.